Good morning, everyone. Can you all hear me all right? Okay. I'll move up a bit. There. Um, before I start reading, just most people in our culture today, or I guess tomorrow, is Halloween, as, as far as most people uh, see it. And or you have to work, maybe. But um, for us, as a, as a Reformed church, we should... Uh, be sure to recognize also, though, that tomorrow is the 499th anniversary of Martin Luther's uh, uh, protest and his nailing the his uh, 95 theses on the, the Wittenberg door. So next year will be the, the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. That was pretty much the, uh, the match that lit the powder keg, as it were. Yes, and it's a formal holiday in a lot of countries overseas, so we should start a petition. <laughs> try to get the day off work. Um, but I'm going to be reading out of, uh, out of Joshua for our Old Testament reading. I'm going to start at the beginning, and I'm not biased, regardless of what Brian thinks. It's, it is a good book. Um, so if, uh, if you could read along with me, please. Now, it came about after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' servant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, cross this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving them to the sons of Israel. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads, I have given it to you, just as I spoke to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and as far as the great sea toward the setting of the sun, will be your territory. No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, so that you may have success wherever you, wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous? Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the midst of the camp, and, and command the people, saying, Prepare provisions for yourself, for within three days you are to cross this Jordan, to go and to possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you, to possess it. To the Reubenites and the Gadites and to the half-tribe of Manasseh, Joshua said, Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God gives you rest and will give you this land. Your wives, your little ones, and your cattle shall remain in the land which Moses gave you beyond the Jordan. But you shall cross before your brothers in battle array, all your valiant warriors, and shall help them until the Lord gives your brothers rest as he gives you. And they also possess the land which the Lord your God is giving them. Then you shall return to your own land and possess that which Moses the servant of the Lord gave you beyond the Jordan toward the sunrise. They answered Joshua, saying, All that you have commanded us we will do, and wherever you will send us we will go. Just as we obeyed Moses in all things, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Anyone who rebels against your command and does not obey your words, in all that you command him shall be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. Just, just a, a note of housekeeping. Uh, Janine was, Janine and I were talking about it, and she said that um, you can really notice when. Uh, Somebody gets on Wi-Fi while we're broadcasting because it drops the, the signal here. We only have so much bandwidth, and I had mentioned that before, but there, there are some people that are on their data on a cell phone, so that's great. But, um, but if you do uh, have to do something on your phone and it, and it, it takes the Wi-Fi, um, try not to do that during, during service. Um, this morning's sermon, it hit me really, really, really hard this week. Where Jesus is before Pilate, and uh, 
he's uh, counted as innocent, but yet he's flogged and beaten and uh, for our sins. And that's why we're here today. It's because he took that upon himself freely. Pray with me. Lord, I just thank you for this week. Lord, I thank you for your spirit guiding into these uh, miraculous things that you have done for us, Lord. Lord, I ask that your spirit enable this uh, preaching today, regardless of anything around us, Lord. Lord, let us focus solely upon you this morning. Lord, give us the ability to praise you. Lord, let our sins be washed in, in your blood, covered in your blood. Lord, let us stand before you holy, for that is your purpose. Lord, we thank you for these things that are so deep that our mind cannot fathom the love that you have for us. Lord, nor can the mind fathom your justice that you have for those who are outside of this. Lord, as we humble ourselves, we come before a loving and most holy and just God. May this, uh, read, may this sermon and reading of your word glorify you. Amen. We're going to read in uh, John chapter 19, verse 1 through uh, 16. It says here, Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him, saying, Hell, king of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and a purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priest and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourself and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered into his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, uh, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on a judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement in Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of the preparation at of the Passover it was about the sixth hour and he said to the Jews behold your king they cried out away with him away with him crucify him Pilate said to them shall I crucify your king the chief priest answered we have no king but Caesar so he delivered him over to be crucified so they took Jesus well you got to look at this in chapter 18, Pilate, way back in chapter 18, Pilate asked, what's the charge? And they really didn't have a charge. And then uh, <laughs> their charge in their official Jewish court was blasphemy. And when they get to Pilate, they says, hey, look, we wouldn't have brought this guy to you if he didn't do something wrong. That was their charge. And Pilate's like, he questions Jesus, they talk. He comes out and he declares in chapter 18 that I find no fault or no guilt in him. That's 18 verse 38. And then 
immediately in chapter 19, it says that he was turned over to be uh, flogged. So who's this guy, Pilate? I'm going to tell you a little bit of history about Pilate. We're not here to study Pilate, but it does play into some of Pilate's thinking. Pilate was uh, Josephus and all those guys regarded Pilate as a ruthless, very staunch ruler over that area. Now, Pilate had been called on a few things in the past. When Pilate took over in the middle of the night as the ruler of that area, in the middle of the night, he come into Jerusalem with some flags and standards of Caesar. And you're not allowed to have flags of Caesar inside Jerusalem because of the, the uh, ad idolatry. You know, so the Jewish people are really mad at Pilate. So they wake up in the morning, they see these flags of Caesar, and they are rioting. They're revolting against Pilate. And then they have this kind of sit down where they, they're like, hey, we're not going to do anything in this city until you remove that stuff from the city. And Pilate says, if you don't get up off your butts and, and do whatever you got to do, I'm going to chop off your heads. Well, next morning comes and they're still revolting. Pilate comes out with his guards to chop off their heads, thinking that they would relent and go back to work. And they, let, they stretched out their necks for Pilate. They said, here, cut it off. So Pilate had to back down. He backed down off of that. And then there was another time where Pilate had put up some golden uh, shields, or, or I, I, I think it was like, um, you know, uh, what's an army guy? You know, a shield. They, it had a face of Caesar on it. And the Jewish people were like, take that down. And they appealed above Pilate to the guy above Pilate, and they come back and ruled that Pilate had to take the stuff down. So Pilate was always in trouble with the Jewish people. And there was another time where they appealed above Pilate, and he kind of got sanctioned for being too mean to the Jews. So I'm thinking some of the thought that went into Pilate's mind is that he's got to handle this trial with great caution because he was worried about his position. Because if they appealed to, to Caesar, the Jewish people were very formally appealing to Caesar and overruling Pilate. And that's what was going on at the time. Now, there are some people that actually, and, and who knows what happened back then, because we don't have that many records, but Justin Martyr actually referenced Pilate during his trial when he was martyred. And he says, see the acts of Pilate about Jesus Christ. Now, he didn't say. Now, there are some people that say that Pilate had a change of heart afterwards, and there's others that don't think that um, one or one or two of the churches actually made Pilate a saint afterwards and he is mentioned in the Apostles Creed so why him instead of the rest of the guys anyways a little bit of background because you're going to see over and over again that Pilate declares Jesus innocent but yet proceeds with the trial I mean what what at what city government do you find somebody innocent but yet still carry out the sentence and here's what happens. So we see in verse 1, then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. <laughs> if you could understand flogging, these are metal or uh, leather straps with pieces of metal attached to the end and pieces of bone attached to the end of leather straps. So Jesus is, is tied naked to a post. And they beat him with these leather straps, and it tears the flesh off his back. It's so bad that the historians say that some people that were flogged were flogged to the point where their entrails came out. It, they, it, their skin wouldn't hold their organs in any longer. And some people actually died from being flogged. It was almost a pre-crucifixion get them ready for the cross so they hurry up and die on the cross type of deal. Or else they would hang on the cross for too long. So it was a prior to the cross thing. Now, here, Pilate, he flogs him, has him flogged, and then rolls him out and said, here, behold the man. And I think he's appealing to him like, hey, I punished him, 
Is that good enough for you? But we, as we know, they keep crying for his, for him to be on the cross. But also, if you'll see here, not only do they flog him, but they, they twist a crown of thorns together, and they place it on his head. They beat him with his fist. They spit on him. Uh, they give him a reed scepter, like he's a king, but he has a a, a, a branch. Instead of a scepter, a king's scepter. Then they put on a purple robe and they mock him. And they say, hell, king of the Jews. And they're mocking him and mocking him. So, in verse 4 here, it says, See, behold, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. Pilate doesn't find guilt in him. Again, in verse 4. But I want to focus today on these sayings, the beholds that Pilate uses. The first one here is in verse 4 where he says, Behold, I find no guilt in him. The next one comes in verse 5 where it says, Behold the man. And then he gives another one, Behold your king. And he's giving this to the crowd. There are other beholds in the Bible. It's like an announcement. You're saying, behold, look at this. If, if you remember John the Baptist, John the Baptist said, behold, uh, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin in the world. And uh, God Himself said, behold, this is My Son who I'm well pleased. And can you picture Jesus standing on the judgment seat of Pilate and you know that God, if He was pleased with Jesus then, He was pleased with Jesus now. Standing bloody on the judgment seat of Pilate, saying, Behold, this is My Son, who I am well pleased. But Pilate says to us, he says to the crowd, Behold the man. Well, behold him. Look at him. Do we look at the man, Jesus, who was beat for our sins? He's standing there, Bloody, innocent, bloody, beaten, tormented for us, for our sins. Spurgeon gave a phenomenal ser sermon on this. Uh, I'm no Spurgeon. I highly encourage, I could give you the name of it. It's phenomenal. I'll make you cry if you listen to it. But in summing up what Spurgeon said, Christian, how can you hold on to your sin when you know that sin is on Jesus Christ standing there bloody, beaten, prepared for the cross? How can we continue in sin knowing that that's the payment for our sin? How can we delight in our sin? Behold the man. Look at him. And that sin that, that's, that, that's plaguing us that we might delight in. But yet, we were not looking at Christ because if we looked at Christ and we saw what He went through to pay the penalty for that sin, you would despise and be disgusted by your sin. But we turn away. And I'm telling you today to look at Christ and look at Him before the cross, at the cross, and say, behold, look at this. And why is that sin so appealing to me? Behold a man. There's your sin stained and bloody on Jesus Christ. And yet we look at that sin and covet it? Let it not be said amongst us Christians. No one was without sin. Not one of us. But let us not look at it in that light. Let me ask you this. If the Holy Son of God was punished that bad, who committed no sin, what's the punishment going to be like for someone who is not the Holy Son of God? Who doesn't have forgiveness in Christ? If, the, if God was willing to put His Son through that punishment for us, how bad can it be for those who do not trust in Jesus Christ? It's horrible. I want to talk a little bit about beholding a man 
Also, on a different note, if you look at Hebrews, in, 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 not Hebrews, but in uh, the language, the Hebrew language, the word man is the same word used for Adam. If you read Genesis and if you were able to read Hebrew, you would see the word man over and over again, even where it says Adam. I don't think Pilate was trying to say this, but I think God was saying this. When Pilate says, Behold the man, we know that our word tells us that Jesus Christ was the second Adam. Behold the man. Genesis 2 7 says, Then the Lord God formed man of the dust from the ground. Genesis 3 9 says, Then the Lord God called the man Adam, or called the man. And the New King James used the word Adam. Other versions use the word man. It's the same word. So when Pilate's saying, Behold the man, I'm seeing that as things are changing. Because we're all under Adam in sin and death. But as Jesus Christ is our representative as man, He's punished for us. See, man was made good. If you look at Genesis 1.27, it says, God created man in His own image. In the image of God, He created him. Male and female, He created them. And then down in verse 31, it says, God saw that all he, that He had made and behold, it was very good. And I believe this is the only time he uses the word very. The other times he says this was good. But here it's very good. And there was evening and morning and the sixth day. But then the commandment came in chapter 2. When we see him uh, creating man. The Lord God commanded the man saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely. But from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in that day that you eat from it, you will surely die. So Adam died in Genesis chapter 3 when he ate from the fruit. And, 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 and a lot of this is a review, but I want you to see this as Jesus standing there on judgment day from Pilate for his judgment, who will, he will turn around and judge Pilate, right? But Jesus is standing there taking our penalty from God because of this. Because of this sin right here in the garden. And Adam, or man, or mankind, died that day spiritually and physically later. We learn that there's corruption in a body. I mean, we see it all the time. We see uh, genetic defects. People born with problems. People die. But what else do we see in the Garden of Eden? We see that um, man hid from God. Ran from God. He didn't want nothing to do with God. Sin entered the world. So now we have a problem. The wages of sin is death. That's what the Word says. So man has to die. A man is dead spiritually and he dies physically. And God could have just left it like that. But you ask, I mean, I always ask, what would it be like for, for Jesus Christ or for to, to not have a sin nature? What would that be like? It was Adam in the garden. And it was Jesus Christ. Go, go, go a couple days without sinning. You see, it's completely impossible, but yet our sins are covered. Wouldn't that, isn't that going to be a wonderful day when we do what we actually want to do? That's going to be wonderful. But Jesus did what He actually wanted to do because therefore He was perfect. And he was risen from the grave, and now he has a perfect body. So spiritually, he was already perfect, and he was raised in perfection. So he conquered both of those for us. See, we have this corruptible body, but, but the Word says that we're going to receive 
an incorruptible body when the Lord returns. We wait up there in the spiritual body until we receive our incorruptible body. So there are two men. Behold the man, there's Adam who failed us miserably and we're all in Adam. And then there's Jesus Christ who conquered the sin and he conquered the grave. And now he has the perfect physical body. 1 Corinthians says this, chapter 15, 21 through 23, for, by, by, for as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each, it is, is, but each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, then at, the, at his coming those who belong to Christ. So, right now, mankind is born in Adam. But Jesus said, didn't he say we must be born again, right? He says we must be born from above. And that's where Christianity, that's where it comes in. This is where it all ties together, right here. Is, is Jesus standing before Pilate taking on our sins? We have to be born from above, born in the Spirit, and made alive in Christ. And that's a supernatural work of God. Romans 5.19 says, For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. By Adam's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So by the one man's obedience, the many were made righteous. So do you see here when Pilate is saying, Behold the man! Because of his obedience, I find no fault in him. I find no guilt in him. But yet he's going to be punished on your account. And that's what happened. All who are born of Adam are born into death. But all who are born of Christ are born into life. Ephesians 2.5 says this. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved. See, see, this whole deal is is all mankind is dead until they're born again. And being born in the Spirit is an act of God. For example, how did Mary have Jesus? It was of the Spirit. That was an act of God. How are we born into this world? Can we make a baby be born apart from God into this world? No. Where do babies come from? I mean, that's, you know, I don't want to get too involved, but it's not just a physical thing. Where does that spark of life come from? And that's being born through Adam. Being born from above comes from above. We have to be born in Christ. So back to Adam. Under Adam, we inherited sin and death. Rebellion against God. And we were under the curse. But look in this uh, section here. Look at verse 11. It says, uh, I want to say that I was sin and death. You know, there's something here that, that I want to mention real quick is there, there's a doctrine of different punishments for sin. Look at uh, uh, verse 11. It says, Therefore he who delivered me over to you has a greater sin. There is, there is different punishments or different levels of sin. We see that in the Old Testament. Some punishment caused death and some was to bring a certain sacrifice and such and such. But the threshold... For God's justice is no sin. None at all. Galatians 3.10 says, For as many are of the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide in all things written in a book of the law to perform them. So, so if we're in Christ though, not in Adam, what do we inherit? We inherit what he inherits. He has 
a perfect resurrected body. Okay? Spirit of God, He's perfect. We become under Adam, I mean under Christ instead of Adam. We are no longer under the curse. And the bondage of sin is lifted on our lives. We shouldn't be able to look at sin and say that has a hold on me because it doesn't have a hold on us. Sin does not have a hold on us because we are of the Spirit. We're born again of the Spirit. And our hearts are changed. Remember Adam and Eve hid from God? Well, we no longer hide from God. We search for God. We, we, come to, we come to gather together to, to give God glory and worship instead of hiding from Him. Why'd they hide from Him? Because they were guilty of sin, right? They were afraid of God because, because they were guilty. Well, we're no longer guilty. Because Christ stood there and took our scourging, and took our crown of thorns, and took our beating, and was hung on that cross for us. We're no longer guilty. We're washed in His blood. So death has no more sting. Your physical body will be raised incorruptible with no more sickness. See, he exchanged, he took our sin and gave us his righteousness. <laughs> Sometimes people say, well, pastor, is God really fair? Because something happens in your life or whatnot. And you say, is God fair? Well, I'll turn that back around. No. Because his son shouldn't have died for your sins. So is he fair? In that respect, no. We should pay our penalty for our sins. See, I guess it just depends on what you're calling fair. If you can't see Jesus Christ standing here taking that bloody beating and hanging on a cross for your sin for the sin of the other Christians of all of us then what's fair that to me trumps everything because that's love and justice at the same time I mean how how could God display a greater love than that and yet a sense of holiness and justice in one, one event. All in that one event. He shows His love and His justice. So, a little bit later here, Pilate walks out and he says, Behold your king! He had just got done saying, Behold the man. Now he comes out and says, Behold your king. What's it say? They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. Well, to the Christian, behold, this is your king. Look at him standing there, bloody beaten, ready for the cross. That is your king. He's our Lord. He went before us. <laughs> and we're to follow after Him. Caesar's not our king. We submit, our we submit to Caesar because He's put over us, but He's not our king. How can the chief priest say, we have no king but Caesar? Christ is our first fruit. It says in a word. It says he's our mediator between God and man. He's sinless and he's perfect, yet he was punished for us. He took our stripes. He died in our place. Through death he conquered death. And he did it of his own free will. He gave us life, but he gave his life and it wasn't taken from him. Verse 11 says, Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me unless it had been given to you from above. Pilate's like, aren't you going to answer me? I have the power to crucify you or to set you free. And Jesus says, you wouldn't have any power over me 
had it not been given to you. If we look at this, Jesus standing there, and we compare why he died, how can we how can we drive or focus or go towards sin? I'm telling you, what we need to do is when that temptation comes, go back to this point. Go back to this cross and say, wait a minute, that sin that's tempting me is the same sin that God had crucified on that cross. That sin was put on His Son. And look at the, the vast amount of love when we have a problem that comes up and we say God's not fair, look at Jesus standing there taking that punishment for us. Look at that love that God has for you. And look at that uh, the justice that, that's required from God if we don't have that. How can we question God's love? How can we question God's plan if we're looking at the cross? We're not going to question His love. We're not going to question His plan. As long as we're looking at the cross, none of this stuff is questionable. So I'll tell you this morning, I say, behold your sin. Or, behold the man. Behold your king. And I'm going to close with reading some Scripture. In all this light, I'm going to read this and then I'm going to pray and we're done. But in all this light, I want you to turn to Romans chapter 8, verse 31 through 39. And I'm going to read this uh, and keep everything I said in your head as we read this. It says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him over for us all. How will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justified. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God. Who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or pearl or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor present things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything other thing created will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Because the reason why this was written is the cross is in view here. The love of God that was poured out upon that day of that cross when that judgment came down for Jesus to die for our sins. That's why that can be true. Because of that day. No, nothing else. So let's, I'm going to pray. Lord, I thank You. I thank You for Your Spirit. I thank You for each stripe that You received on our account, Lord. Lord, I thank You for humbling Yourself, for coming down when You didn't have to. Lord, for wearing the crown of thorns, for carrying the reed scepter, for Lord, for taking the beating. Lord, for being spat on. Lord, for being in a mockery trial. Lord, you were, you kept your mouth quiet. Lord, we are all judged in this if we do not have your forgiveness, if we do not have your blood covering us. Lord, we humble ourselves this morning and we ask for your forgiveness. And for anything that we may do that offends you, Lord. Lord, we ask that you drive us to the cross. Lord, that we would see your cross in light of our sin. And Lord, that we would be disgusted and repulsed by any sin against you. By any rebellious act that we might commit.
that we would be repulsed by that. Lord, I ask you to show each person here and listening of your great love, of that love that you had to take all this for us. And Lord, show each person your great justice for if we, do, if we reject such a salvation as this, what wrath abides upon our heads. Lord, may we glorify.